Let's read our song together. I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore I shall call upon him as long as I live. Father, we thank you that we can call upon you. We thank you even just for our time this morning, Lord, that we can get on our knees before you and bring our needs to you. We thank you for that. Thank you that you hear us. Thank you that you incline your ear to us, that you want to hear us, and you encourage us to come to you. So we pray today, God, as we worship, that you would, it would be acceptable, it would be a, uh, a sweet-smelling savor in your, your nose, that you would smell the fragrance of worship and praise, and that you would be honored and glorified. We ask you in Jesus.
You have 
Father, we thank you, God, again that we should be with you. We thank you, God, that death was arrested and our lives began. Thank you for that. Thank you for your work in us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. We pray now that you would come and teach us. Help us to listen to you. We ask you, Jesus. Amen. Have a seat. I was thinking there was another song. Have four <laughs> mm. You ever think of those words? When death was arrested, my life began. Some of the songs that we sing, sometimes we just go through them real quickly. Hopefully we're listening to what it's actually saying. Death was arrested and our life began. Well, I got a lot of things on my mind. It seems like during this time of trying to uh, move on to the book of John, we've, we've heard some things, we've listened to some things, we've read some things. Uh, and we're just somewhat overwhelmed at this time with what's actually taking place in our life um, on this earth. What's going on? What's happening? So you're gonna to have to bear with me a little bit because it's kind of not where I was gonna go this morning, but it's where we're going. So we're gonna. I want to read first before we start in the book of John. I want to read first Second Timothy. You're probably all familiar with these verses. I'm going to read 2 Timothy chapter 3. A part of chapter 3. Because this is where my mind has been. This is where it felt like this whole week that God has been revealing and leading my heart and my thoughts. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul talking to Timothy. He says this, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. I just want us to make sure we understand what's going on here. Paul is talking to Timothy. We know that these kinds of people exist in the world. We know that the world is full of sin, full of death, full of disobedience. Paul is talking to Timothy in the last days. He's given him an idea of what the people, what the church is going to be like. People who are professed Christians. He's given them an idea. He's given Timothy an idea that this is what it's going to look like in the last days. The church is going to be full of people who are like this. So from that perspective, <clears throat> I'm going to go on and finish reading a couple more verses. That's why he says down in verse 6, no, verse 5, where he says, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. 
avoid such men as these. Holding to a form of godliness. These are people you're going to run into every day. People we're going to, we're going to spend time with in the church. <clears throat> It says, always learning, verse 7. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men will oppose the truth. Men of depraved minds, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all. Just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also known. The Bible says that judgment is going to start in the house of God when judgment starts. And what we see is these people, professed believers in Jesus Christ, people who have made a profession of Jesus Christ, are going to be brought to the surface. Now I want to jump back over to our text. We're going to read John chapter 8. Because I feel like it, it feeds into where we're going. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you do, turn to John chapter 8. And I'm just going to ask a question before we start. You don't have to raise your hands, but I want you to think. Have you read your Bibles this week? Have you gotten into the Word of God at all this week? Because I want you to know this, that we talked about this before. When, <clears throat> when people in a bank want to know what a counterfeit dollar looks like, they don't study the counterfeit dollar. They go to classes and they study the real thing. So when something fake comes through, they know it. If you need to be in the Word of God, if you've read one chapter this week, you need to read two next week. You need to push yourselves. We need to push ourselves to be so immersed in this Word now, when these people come along that we just read about in 2 Timothy, that we're not, first of all, that we're not one of them. And that we're not living our lives like one of them. And second of all, that we'll be able to pick those people out. And that we're not following those people. So turn to chapter 8, John. I don't mean this hear me from the beginning. I don't mean this to be a condemning type of message, but I mean this to be reality. Because this is what it's all about. This is reality. This is what's going on. I see 2 Timothy happening already. We see it taking place before our eyes. The articles we read, the people we read about, the, the videos we watch, the things that we see happening in the church nationwide, this is taking place. John chapter 8, we left off uh, last time in verse 30. <clears throat> and that's where we're going to start. I'm just going to read a couple of verses. We're going to read verse 30 through verse 36. John chapter 8, verse 30. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If you continue my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. 
The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Stop there. Because I just can't get past, I can't blow past this verse <clears throat> and just continue on to John without taking a moment because of what I've been felt impressed with and because of what we just read in 2 Timothy that we need to look at. I want to um, okay. I'm trying to figure out where to go here. I told you my mind was all messed up a little bit with this. I guess I want to focus on verse 31 because that's that's a telltale sign. Okay. Verse 31 says, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. It doesn't say if you made a confession of faith. It doesn't say if you've read your Bible once. I think some of the translations will say if you abide in my word, or if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. This is about being a true disciple. This is an urgent and important subject for today. Not only for today, but where we are in the book of John. This is an important subject. Many people profess Christ. Many people declare themselves to be believers in Christ. Many people give witness to the fact that they are Christians. In fact, it's pretty common, even in our culture today, to say that you're a Christian. But who is a true Christian? Who's a real disciple? This is an urgent and essential question for us. You have to be able to answer it for yourself. And you have to be able to answer it for those around you. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, who addresses this in 2 Corinthians. We have a slide of the verse. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Test yourself, or prove yourself, to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves? that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. Test yourselves and see if you are in the faith. Examine yourself. What Paul's saying is test yourself to see whether you are really in Christ or not. See if you can pass the test. That's a similar issue to what Jesus is saying about being a true disciple of mine. So who is a true disciple? Who is a true learner, a true follower of Christ? True in the sense of real or genuine or authentic? It's a very important question for us. And a very important question at this place that we're at in the gospel, considering where we came through. Because we've seen indications of faith and belief all through the gospel of John so far. We've seen, um, we've seen them since the beginning of the gospel. We've seen true faith, such as in the case of the early disciples in chapter 1. Those people who came to Christ and who truly believed and became disciples of him. We saw that in chapter 1. And we've seen less than true faith in those who believed in chapter 2. But Jesus it says, but Jesus didn't commit himself to them because he knew what was in their hearts. And he knew their faith wasn't a real thing. They were following him because of the signs and the wonders he was doing. It wasn't true faith. 
And we saw in chapter 3 that Nicodemus kind of represented those people. He said that they did not believe. I mean, he said that they believed that Jesus was a teacher come from God. Because no one could do the works that he did unless God was sent. Unless God sent him. But we also know that Jesus said that that's not sufficient to save. That's not good enough. There were people who saw, there were people we saw all the way back in chapter, all the way through to chapter 6, who called themselves disciples. They identified as disciples, but turned their backs and walked away from Christ. We saw that. We read that when Jesus said to his disciples, Will you walk away also? Will you leave? They walk no more with him, it says in chapter 6, verse 66. So how can we tell who's real? Remember Judas? Jesus says in chapter 6 that he's a devil and a betrayer. But the disciples didn't recognize that. They didn't see that. In fact, even at the end of the life, at the end of Jesus' life when they were in the upper room, uh, the night of his betrayal, Jesus said, one of you will betray me. And they didn't all point to Judas. What they said was, was, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? They didn't know Judas was a betrayer. They didn't know that he was a false believer. How hard is it then to tell? There were believers who turned their back and walked away from Christ. There's a man, I wasn't sure as far as saying names, but I'm just going to leave his name out for now. There's a man who's a pastor, who's been a pastor for years and years and years. He's written several books. Uh, I can probably say the name of the book. He wrote, he wrote a book that's called Kissing Baby Goodbye. been a pastor for years. He's chose to walk away from his faith. He chose to join himself to the LGBT community. start with this. He says he's writing to this man. You have walked away from your marriage. No. I'm going to skip. I'm going to go up. Uh, I'm going to start a little sooner. I don't think I can reach you in private. And what you have said and done is very public. So I'm reaching out to you this way. You have walked away from your marriage. That's not right. You have walked away from your faith in Christ. That's even worse. This says nothing about Jesus and a great deal about you. Jesus told us there would be false prophets and teachers among us. Your story doesn't invalidate Christ's message because he predicted that people would do exactly what you have done. I just didn't expect it would be you. I do commend you for your intellectual integrity, for recognizing 
that your secondary views embracing the LGBT community agenda are utterly inconsistent with Christianity, as is your view that it is okay to walk away from your marriage for the reasons you have stated. Both of these prove that you have renounced Christianity before you ever said so publicly. My heart aches for you in so many ways. It seems that you thought that Christianity was a series of formulas. Formula for marriage. Formula for systematic theology. Fear of choosing the wrong formula. Fear of falling. A fear of failing to live up to your formula. You know that I believe in the general approach to courtship that made you famous and pretty rich. You included the story of my oldest daughter and her husband in your second book. I still believe that purity of mind and body before marriage is the right ideal. But it is not a formula for a happy marriage. It is simply a guiding principle that has to be aligned with wisdom, applied with wisdom, grace, and often forgiveness. I would never reach this conclusion about you on my own, but what you have said yourself can be fairly, fairly summarized as this. You thought your faith and your marriage was based on formulas. They never went deeper than that. Jesus says about people like you that in the last judgment, he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You know that this means that you actually never knew him? As immersed as you were in the Christian culture and a career as a pastor, you never actually knew Jesus. It gives me only heartache to say these things to you. And Jesus will take no pleasure in pronouncing those words in judgment of you and anyone who hadn't walked away from a relationship. Who, who hadn't who haven't walked away from a relationship with Jesus. You have walked away from the culture you have been raised in. Sorry, let me go back. You haven't walked away from a relationship with Jesus. You walked away from a culture you have been raised in. Jesus still loves you at this moment, and so do I, and countless others. And I will love you no matter what the days ahead bring. But my love is tinged with deep sadness. You and your story are not the measure of the validity of Christianity. Jesus is real. He doesn't want you to return to your prior formulas. He wants you to come to Him for the first time and learn to love. I am praying for you with love and sorrow. So that's a man who's been Christian for a long time. Listen to John, the writer of the gospel, when he writes in his first epistle. He writes this. They went out from among us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. How hard is it to tell who a true believer in Jesus Christ really is today? John is saying there are going to be people who are going to be part-time, superficial, shallow, who won't last, who will go out from us and demonstrate that they are not really of us. John and the other apostolic writers make much of an issue of this. The writer of Hebrews addresses this multiple times, but at the end of chapter 10, he says this in verse 38. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith 
to the preserving of our soul. And earlier he says, you have need of endurance. There are people who endure, persevere, remain faithful to the end. And then there are those who are defectors. Again, the example of all spiritual defectors in the scriptures, all false disciples, is none other than Judas himself. So how do we tell? We've all had the experience of wondering if someone is a disciple or not. Well, we know in the scriptures Jesus tells some parables. I'm sure you guys have read the parables of Christ. In Matthew 13, he talks about a parable of the wheat and the tares. And in these parables, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven here on earth. As the church is developed, as the church is growing, uh, as people are being brought into the church. He talks about the wheat and the tares growing together and that we would be unable to tell them apart in every case. Some places, In some cases, we clearly can. The Bible says that by your fruit you will know them. But sometimes it will be hard to distinguish. And the only distinguishing will come at the end of the judgment when the angels do the work of God and separate the wheat from the tares. The idea of the wheat and the tares in the scriptures talk about wheat that, that he plants a field and wheat is growing in the field, and the enemy comes along. Read the parables yourself. I don't want to cover the whole parable. But the enemy comes and sows tares in the field of the wheat. And he says, should we go pull the tares out? And the master of the field says, no. Let them grow together. And in the end, they'll be separated. The tares will be separated from the wheat, and they will be cast into the fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the wheat and the tares grow together in the kingdom of God. They look the same. They act the same. If you've ever seen a picture of this, the wheat and the tares, the actual tares that grow, look just like wheat. But they'll be left to grow together until the end. And there's another parable Jesus tells. It's called the dragnet. Jesus tells the parable of the dragnet. In the parable of the dragnet, a dragnet is cast into the sea with weights on it, and it's pulled along the bottom of the ocean to the shore, and it fills up with all kinds of fish. Then a fisherman sits down and does his business by sorting the fish into good fish and bad fish. The fish worth keeping were gathered into containers, but the, the rest were tossed aside. Jesus interprets these parables to his disciples. This one of the dragnet, he interprets uh, to his disciples. He says this, this is how it will be in the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus tells another parable of the mustard seed, or the mustard tree. The parable of the mustard tree, that the kingdom is going to grow out of all proportion to its real life. And it's going to be, be full of all kinds of birds. You need to read these so you can understand the picture. He says this tree will grow from a little seed. It will grow into a great tree with great branches. And it will be filled with all kinds of birds.
in a parable, the kingdom that's growing is going to grow beyond its actual size. That's what we talk about. You know, there's so many people who are believers in this world, but yet the true church of Christ is going to be a remnant, the Bible talks about. So in all this, how do we know who's real? How do we figure it out? Is this person saved? Is this person not saved? Is this a true Christian? Is this a false Christian? How do we know? How do we tell? You may be thinking about this about your spouse. I wonder if he's really saved. I wonder if she's really a Christian. You might be thinking about your children. You know, they talk about God, but are they actually saved? Maybe asking about your neighbor or somebody that you know. Maybe asking about a person who's at work and talks about being a Christian. But you're wondering if it's legitimate because you see the behavior. Maybe asking about a person you see occasionally at church. And you kind of wonder, where are they at? So we all deal with this. I'm sure that sometimes it all comes to our minds. I wonder if I'm actually a Christian. I wonder if this person I know is actually a believer. This is crucial. I just want you to see that this is crucial. So we all deal with it. We all ask the question, who's real? Who's genuine? Now, we don't ask the question necessarily about everybody, but there were some people that we're asking the question about. We might even be wondering about our own condition. There are many people who say they believe but may not be real. In the case of the man that we talked about, the pastor, my opinion, my, I would say, I believe, and we, can, we don't want to get into the whole idea of it, but people like this, we would say they were never truly, really, truly saved. Because how? I, I just don't understand within myself, how can somebody just walk away from God like that? It doesn't seem like it could be real. So who's genuine? There's many who believe. Many who say they believe. So, in our text, here we meet some Jews who, according to verse 30 and 31, had believed in Jesus. They believed, it says. It says in verse 31, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in Him. They believed because initially, it's kind of easy to believe. Just, just walk with me through this. You're drawn by a crowd. They were drawn by a crowd, as we saw in chapter 6. Excuse me. They were fascinated by the supernatural. He's healing people. He's casting out demons. He's giving them free food. He's doing all those kinds of things that provide amazing benefits to the people. It all seems so wonderful. He's promising forgiveness of sins. He's promising heaven. All of this. People still seek Jesus on this basis. They still come after Him initially on this basis. People who are seeking personal fulfillment. People who want a better life. People who want answers. People who are tired of their weaknesses. Tired of falling into temptation. People who are weary of bad habits. Who want more out of life. People who want to escape fear. Who want to feel secure. 
People who want some hope in the life to come. They're afraid of death. Seeking heaven. Desiring spiritual help. Wanting to belong to a loving group of people. For all of those reasons, starting to believe in Jesus is easy. A lot of people do that. A lot of people come to Jesus Christ for all different reasons. That's the easy part. Initially to believe is easy. But when they start in that direction and the world, the flesh, and the devil fully starts to pull hard against Christ in their life, the half-believer is unwilling to yield to the hard demands and the true repentance and humble submission to Christ falls back. He gives up. He walks away. It may take a little while. It may take a long time. But sooner or later, they lay down their sword and they walk away. That's how it struck me when I read about this man. I think Terry and I looked at each other and we were like, another guy, another person laying down his sword and walking away. I could have made a list within the last couple of years of the people who have walked away. It's like this, you know, we say that when persecution, and this is why God has always brought persecution in the church, all through the New Testament, see. God brings persecution because it purifies His church. Because you're not going to die and suffer for something that you don't truly believe in. You're not gonna. There is no way. Pain has a way of bringing us to a point of determining what we actually believe. So it may take a little while, it may take a long time, but sooner or later, those people will walk away. So again, we come back to the question. How do we know who is a true believer? Mental assent to Jesus is not enough. The Bible says that the devils believe and tremble. That's in James chapter 2. The devils believe and tremble. So mental assent is not good enough. So what's the benchmark? How do we know? Well, if we read verse 31 again, it's obvious. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples. Here it is, the benchmark. So what's the benchmark? To me, when I read this verse, the benchmark is perseverance. It's endurance. Perseverance, or if you want another word, if you like the word endurance. Perseverance and endurance. That's the issue. How can we tell a true believer? Perseverance, endurance. That's the benchmark. If you continue in my word, that simple statement ought to be underlined in everyone's Bible, in everyone's mind. If you continue in my word, What happened when you were saved is you confessed Jesus as what? You confessed Him as Lord. That's the great Christian confession. Jesus, I confess You as Lord and Savior of my life. Jesus is Lord. The Greek word is kurios. I am the Greek word Dulos, which means his slave. 
He is my master, my Lord. And that is essentially defines what it means to be obedient. He's the master. We are the slaves. He is the master. I am the slave. He is the sovereign. He is the ruler. He gives the orders and the commands. I respond in loving obedience. So what's the mark of a true believer? It's not a profession of faith. It's not that you say, I've accepted Jesus in my life. It's not some past event that happened. That's not the benchmark of a believer. This man we talked about made that profession. Made that confession. J.C. Ryle says this about this passage. He believes that it's the most dangerous spiritual condition of any person can ever be in. Where, he, where, where, where you are halfway between Christ. You're inclined to Jesus. You're inclined to the truth about Jesus. Wanting what Jesus provides and what He offers but not willing to give in to the full demands that He lays on us as sinners. The demands of repentance and faith in Him. Declaration of His Lordship. Turning from sin towards righteousness. And continuing in His Word. Does this make sense to you? Is this... Is this it's not enough just to profess, just to confess that I believe who Jesus is. Like I said, I, I could have brought a list of people who through the years were people who people would look to and say, that's a man of God. That's a woman of God. This is a, you know, this pastor. I mean, this guy, this guy, this guy. And who slowly started to walk away from the faith. We saw in Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus says, Many will come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And Jesus says, Depart from me, I never knew you. You workers of lawlessness, you workers of unrighteousness, you workers of iniquity. So the example of a true believer is someone who continues in his word. Who abides in his word. Remember in John chapter 15 it talks about, well we're not there yet but we'll get there. But if you've read your Bible in John chapter 15 it talks about he is the vine we are the branches. And that as branches we need to abide in him. Because that's where our lifeblood comes from. So I want to go back again to what Paul said. Test yourself. Prove yourself. Have you made it? To, that's why I asked, have you read your Bibles lately? Test yourself. Prove yourself to see if you're actually in the faith. Not that you made a profession, but are you continuing in His Word? Or are we picking and choosing the things we want to continue in and other things we're pushing aside because we're not ready to make that type of commitment? Test yourself. See if you're in the faith. Examine yourself. We talked about this before communion. We say to examine yourself before you take communion. We need to be sure. Even if we've made that 
confession, when we've made that profession of faith, we need to prove ourselves. We need to look over, look back to the time when you made that profession of faith and look to where you are today. Are you continuing in His work? It was pretty plain what Jesus said. If you continue in my word, then you are truly a disciple of mine. That is one of the passages that we read over because it's in, it's in the midst of a story. And we just read through it. Are we continuing? If you can look at yourself over the last month, two months, three months, and you're not continuing in his word, you need to back up. reason being is this. It's because in the end, when perilous times come, the pressure is going to be put on you to decide what side of the line you're standing on. But the man we just talked about, obviously, he decided to step over the line and chose. He renounced his Christian faith. And honestly, honestly, I honestly believe that this is going to happen to every one of us. You're going to have to make a decision. Where do I stand? I know I made a profession of faith, but am I going to continue in His Word? Or am I just going to stop here? I'm going to read 2 Timothy again. Because I think that this portion of Scripture is very pertinent to today's life. We've got to decide, guys. It's not a game. It's not a thing that we can just come on Sunday morning and play this church or play this Christian game. This is real. And that's the only reason I'm trying to be a little firm with it. This is real. In the end, you don't want to hear, depart from me because I never knew you. You don't want to hear those words. Those words are actually going to be spoken. So I'm going to read chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good. That's two separate things. Brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these, for among them are those who enter into households and captive weak women weighed down with sins, laid on by various impulses. Verse 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. But they will not make for progress, for their folly will be obvious to all. Just as Janus and Jambres, folly was also known. Now you, Followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as has happened to me at Antioch, this is Paul, remember, at Iconium, and at Lystra, where persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse. Deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Honestly, there needs to be a message just on this portion of scripture because it's full. Judgment will start in the house of God. If you're not real, you're going to be brought to the surface. Because the judgment of God is a purifying process that happens in the church. It happens in people's lives. That God will, God will provide avenues in your life, whether it's persecution, whether it's uh, hard times that you're going through, but you'll be purified. If you're true, you'll be purified and you'll move on. If you're not true, that purification process is going to stop you in your tracks. And you're going to lay down your sword and you're going to walk away. But know that this is talking about, I believe, 2 Timothy 3 is talking about people in the church are going to be disobedient. They're going to be arrogant. They're going to be unholy. They're going to be lovers of pleasure. They're going to be more concerned with the score of their baseball game or their soccer game or their basketball game is more concerned with that than the things of Jesus Christ. That's going to take priority in their life. So I guess we'll just end with that. So Jesus was saying to those Jews or all of us who believe if you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciples. You're truly disciples of mine. Prove your own self. Are you continuing in his word? It's not to condemn. It's to open our eyes to reality. Father God, in light of all of this, in light of our flesh, in light of the things that your scriptures talk about, our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, we know that we deal with the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Lord, we know that your verses, your scriptures speak to us. Jesus' own words. That if you continue in my words, then you are truly a disciple of mine. I pray, God, at this time, this time in history, as you work to purify your church, because I believe that this is the end of the end time. There's too many signs. There's too many things happening. There's too many realities coming to our minds and to our ears and things that we read. People who are laying down the sword and walking away from their faith. So I believe, God, that this is the end of the end of times. And I pray, Father, that somehow you would make this a reality in us. Help us to be fearful that we don't hear those words apart from the end of the day. I pray that you would give us courage to continue in your word. Whatever it is, whatever you put your finger on in our life, 
whatever your word talks about, even some of those things that we push aside because we're not, we don't feel like we're ready for that. Or we're not even sure of what that all means. But I pray, God, in those areas that you would give us the faith to believe. Faith to step out on that ocean, on that sea, even though it looks stormy. Knowing that you're going to be there to lead us. I pray for this in us, God. Whether we're a church, whether we're not a church, that's not the issue. The issue is each one of us as individuals will stand before you someday. We just want to stand before you with clear hearts, knowing that we've continued in your word. We can say like Paul that I fought the good fight. I finished the faith. Father, we pray. Hope that you would work in us. Show us our need. Because if we don't know what our need is, we would not see your glory. We pray today that you would show us our need in this area. Are we continuing? Or are we just in a boat floating with the current? courage, give us strength to row against the tide. As we know as the days go on, we're going to need more and more of your grace. I ask that you do that in us. In Jesus' name. Let's stand for worship.
deepest places in you are calling to the fountains of my soul. From the dirty draw me out, then you draw me out again. Like Jonah from the deep, I'm coming out of my sleep. Find the secrets that you keep, but the only thing worth rising for. Don't hold back, relentless in pursuit. 
chase me down, seek me out. How can I be lost when you have called me found? Chase me down, seek me out. How can I be lost when you have called me found? Like a tired wave, pressing on. Strange. 
about the end. Uh, Jesus' disciples questioned him about the, his coming, about the end of the age and about his coming. He said, at that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. The love of many will grow cold but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. It's talking about our love to God. Not only toward each other, but the love of many in the end will grow cold towards God. Father, we thank you again, God, for your grace and your mercy. We pray, Lord, for help. We know, Lord, that as we read your word, we know that it's only going to get worse before it gets better. But we know that we can walk through any storm. Anything that life throws at us, we know that we can walk through that if you're with us. I pray you would help us to continue in your word, not just to be people who profess, not just to be people who read our Bibles once in a while, the people who take the Word of God and apply it in our lives. People who are willing to lay down whatever it is in our life because your Word calls for it. So we ask for your grace and your help as we desire to be the people you desire us to be. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.